So good morning, everyone. I'm Audrey Russo, President and CEO of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, and welcome to the ninth and final day of the STEM Summit. And what an amazing adventure through the tech industry in Pittsburgh it has been. So don't go away because we still have some exciting stuff coming up in this next 45 minutes. I am joined today by Marie Poloni. She's Director of Talent Attraction and STEM Development, and she's a former teacher and she is our in-house resident nerd. But you won't know that by the way that she introduces this. She is filled with passion. And I am thrilled to have you join us today in this final day. We're gonna climb on board the passenger riverboat, the explorer with the rivers of steel. Joining us today is Susie Bloom, the Director of Education, and Captain Ryan O'Rourke, Captain and Boat Operations Management. I love those titles. I want a title like that in my job. So through the STEM Summit, we have had students and educators join us from over 193 different educational institutions. And I've just got to say, Thank you. Thank you to every educator, each and every one of you, administrator and school staff for being on the front line, for continuing to fight for our students and families. These are very surreal times and we applaud you. And we're just trying to do our little part in making sure that you get connected to all the innovation that is happening here in Southwestern Pennsylvania. So about the Tech Council, real quickly, we work to connect talented and curious students in all of our region to our membership tech companies. It's over a thousand local tech businesses that are doing things in manufacturing, in life sciences, in artificial intelligence, in autonomous vehicles, just the most amazing array of things that are happening here right outside our doors. So we, we wanna make sure that all of you understand what's happening and as a result, these industries have come together to help and build these companies and they wanna change the world as well, but they need you. They need each and every one of you who are in school, who are thinking about the future, thinking about what's next and understanding that there's a lot of opportunity here. The jobs that you're gonna hear about today are may not even be the same jobs in three years. So that's what we want to share with you. So today I wanna to thank for the entire series, the Pittsburgh Community Television, PCTV. This is not only being recorded, but it's simultaneously broadcast live. So each day of the STEM Summit will also be available on demand, as well as at the Pittsburgh Technology Council website. As I mentioned before, a little bit about Marie Poloni, I'm just gonna pass the baton to her. She is our resident science and math educator, but now she has really amped up our game to make sure that the talent and all of you in, that are working in the educational systems understand the connections. That's what we're here for. So Marie, take it away. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, PMI. Thank you for everybody joining us today. And thank you for sure to Rivers of Steel. We are so excited to have you here today. As Audrey said, I'm Marie Poloni, Director of Talent Attraction, STEM Development. Today and each day of the STEM Summit, we really want maximum participation from everybody involved. Those of you in your classrooms, at home, the student co-hosts that we have today. And we have three great student co-hosts today that I'll introduce you to in a moment. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a hand and a Q&A. If you have any questions, any comments, go ahead and type it in to the Q&A. We're gonna do our best to get to all of your questions. Everything is really secure, so no one can see your name or your question, except for us as the host. And throughout the talk today, my co-hosts who are students all just like you will be asking questions, not only of the speakers, but of all of you as well. And we're gonna do that in a moment. So before we meet the team of Rivers of Steel, I wanna introduce you to our student co-hosts. We have Ajna, we have Aiden, we have Simon. They'll be leading the show. They are first gonna start with a question for you. So Mr. Aiden, if you're ready, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Aiden, introduce yourself to everybody. Hi, I'm Aiden, I'm seven years old. Well, don't forget though, you're almost eight. When do you turn eight? Um, at the end of November. 
I mean, that's pretty awesome. He has a question for everybody in the audience and you can raise your hand or you can put it in Q&A. Go ahead, Aiden. Raise your hand if you've ever been on the Explorer boat. Very good, Aiden. Has anyone here, oh, we have some students raising their hand. Oh my goodness, so far we only just have one. Has anyone done a tour with Rivers of Steel or been on the Explorer Riverboat? We kind of hope no one has, because then this will be even cooler. All right, yeah, Aiden, look at that. We only have one. Aiden, have you ever been on the Explorer Riverboat? No. Okay, well, cool. Okay because you're about to be on it. All right, then let's hear from Ajna. Hi everyone, I'm a senior in Pittsburgh and I work with an organization called STEM and Buds that also works to bring STEM educational opportunities to kids. And I'll be asking you all a polling question. Um, today, you will embark on the Explorer. The Explorer is one of the world's first passenger river bo boats built to lead standards. What does lead stand for? Leaders in environmental energy delivery, long range energy in the environmental diagnosis, leverage environmental energy delivery, or leadership in energy and environmental design. And yeah, go ahead and take a second to just answer that question as best as you can. Well done, Ajna. I'm so happy to have you back. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. She doesn't act nearly as cool as she is. She started her own 501c3 at North Allegheny School District when you were in what grade? Ninth grade? Tenth grade? Yeah. <laughs> She's pretty cool. All right, the answers are coming in. Ajna, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. All right, and we have 21% of you all said long range energy in the environmental diagnosis. And then the other 79% of you all said leadership in energy and environmental design. Excellent job. These kids know what they're talking about. And Captain Ryan will talk to you about why we care about lead when it comes to a riverboat. Um, then we have Simon, let me get your question up. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi there, everybody. My name's Simon, and I'm uh, coming at you from Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm a junior at West High School here. And um, so the question here, we have, many of you know, plankton is, um, it's almost a plant, but it's too, it's microscopic. It's almost too small to see. And the question is, why is plankton essential to the river ecosystem? I can't do Aiden, did I not let you vote? Which one do you want to pick, buddy? Um, uh, I'm going to think, I think that one. I think it's this one. Which one is it? One A, B, C, or D? Aiden says A. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Get your last answers in there. Oh, there's still a few more voting. All right, I'll end the poll. I'm gonna share the results. Simon, go ahead and read what was the most popular answer. All right, looks like a lot of you know your stuff. The most popular and correct answer was that plankton provides a primary food source for zooplankton and it is the base for the river food chain. Well done. Thank you, Simon. And you're going to actually get to see some of this today. I'm going to turn it over to the staff at Rivers of Steel, Captain Ryan O'Rourke and Susie Bloom are joining us today. Thank you and take it away. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to share a little bit about Rivers of Steel programming with you. Um, today we are showcasing our environmental science programs, but we also have programs in preservation, history, art. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do with Rivers of Steel. But today we're looking at the programs on the Riverboat Explorer. We do have some video footage. It's a little hard for us to live stream directly from the boat. Um, so we have some pre-recorded footage that we'll share with you. 
Um, and I have a portion and so does Captain Ryan. And we'll stop to also uh, allow you to ask some questions. Um, so here we are gonna screen share some of our video footage and
called plankton toe, T-O-W. And it has very tiny holes in the net. These are 80 micron sized holes. And we will drag this net in that photo zone. So there's a float net. We'll help keep our net up at the surface of the river. That way we're capturing where the plankton are most likely to be found uh, in our water. And there's also a little clip at the bottom of the net that we close up before we throw this into the river. And it allows us to seal off the plankton. So we're trapping things inside this net and we can gather that sample to take up to our microscopes. So I'm gonna stop here and let our deckhands know that we're going to be putting a net into the water and get their permission to throw our net in. And I see we had a question. We had a hand raise. Uh, just pause briefly if um, if we wanted to address the question. If you want to type it in the Q and A box. You know what? I think you're good to go for now. Good? I think it okay. might have been from before, but yep, you're okay. good. Okay. Then I will continue sharing. All right. So we are going to throw the plankton toe into the river and let it drag for about two minutes to get a good sample. And you'll be able to see it behind the boat and I kind of just toss it out like a football. Let it unwind a little bit, give it a little extra line. And you can see I'm trying to keep it within that photo zone as it drags. to make a wet mount slide and that will allow us to take 
take a look at what is in that sample of water and hopefully we will find plankton. And I'm going to put the slide on our microscope setup here. Uh, this is a camera that hooks onto the eyepiece of our microscope and it's all connected through a computer and then through a screen here. So that way everybody can see what I'm viewing under the microscope. Um, we can make it a lot larger to have it on camera today. So to make a wet mount slide, really all you are doing is putting a couple drops of what we collected onto a regular slide. This doesn't have a well in it. It's just a regular flat glass slide. And just a couple drops is all you need. And then you're going to take a cover slip and this just mushes everything down. So you just drop it in place and hope that you don't get any air bubbles in your wet mount slide. And then all of this can go under our microscope and we will take a look. And sometimes this is like fishing. Sometimes you make a slide, you don't see a whole lot on it and you might want to adjust and add some new liquid to your microscope, new uh, portions of that sample, but it looks like we're, we're pretty lucky so far right out of the gate. I can see some different shapes on here. So when you look at plankton, most of it has a pretty defined shape. So what I'm seeing right here, this is from our golden brown algae category. They're also known as diatoms. And diatoms have, it's like a glass shell around them. And this particular one is called Melosyra. It's a very common one that we find in the rivers. And then you can see we have this little guy. And this is an example of sometimes plants that have little hairs on them or oil on them that allow them to move about in the slide. So they're still plants, but they can move like animals. Um, so this particular one is called Cynura and it's just rolling along there, but it's also in that diatomaceous or diatom category. Uh, you can also see it's golden brown as well. And we're gonna just scan around on the microscope and see if there's additional things here and maybe we can find some zooplankton as well. that they can in the water. Um, so you can see him floating along. Again, I'm not sure, I haven't seen him move, but he has his eye spot here and the legs, and you can see the hairs on the legs. Um, and next to him is more of that Melosyra. And there's also another one zipping through that's moving so fast that I'm having trouble identifying him at the moment. We'll see if we can get a better view of him or her. So again, you can see the eye spot very clearly and the legs of this organism. And a lot of these will survive throughout the winter. Um, some will sink lower uh, where the water's going to be warmer throughout winter time. Um, so they're able to overwinter in, in the deeper uh, parts of the river. So we can see part of a worm-like organism. I'm gonna see if I can find if he has mouth parts or not, because that will help me identify if it's a worm or another organism. This could also be related to the midge family where it might have mouth parts that allow it to tear apart the phytoplankton. But I'm guessing this organism right now, as you can see, it's in the midst of a whole bunch of phytoplankton. It's probably trying to eat that phytoplankton. It does look like it has eye spots and there, it's a little bit more complex than um, just a worm. So it could be insect larvae. So eventually this will grow a little bit larger, um, could turn into a fly, um, something that you would see on land. exoskeleton um, so this is uh, the abdomen part and the tail that has broken off of an organism and again part of a zooplankton that was once alive uh, it either shed the exoskeleton or something ate part of that zooplankton and you are seeing what is left
preserved specimen of a paddlefish. And paddlefish are native to this river. Um, they're a fish that can get rather large. So these ones are pretty young. These ones were probably about nine months when they were preserved. They were raised in a fish hatchery uh, by the Fish and Boat Commission. So Fish and Boat Commission raises these to put them back into our rivers. This is their natural habitat, but at one point in time they were extirpated from the rivers, meaning they were gone from their natural habitat. It's different than being extinct because they were still living in other parts of the world, just not here in Pittsburgh. So in order to rebalance that ecosystem, Fish and Boat Commission decided to raise them, reintroduce them to our three rivers. And the reason we are showing them today alongside plankton is plankton's their favorite food. So just like a baleen whale would eat in the ocean, our paddlefish will also eat using that filter feeding technique. So inside their mouth, they don't have teeth. They have things called gill rakers. Um, so they have a funny looking inside of their mouth that allows them to filter feed the plankton and get the nutrition from the plankton. Um, because of this, they can't be caught by traditional fishing methods. They're not interested in a worm on a hook, uh, but they're also protected in this state. You're not allowed to intentionally fish for a paddlefish. If you were to try to fish for one, in some states where it is legal, you would use a snagging technique, so you would drag hooks in the water to try to capture them. And typically, these are found at the surface of the waterway because, again, they're capturing plankton. They're going to be in that photo zone. So they swim with their mouth open towards the surface and filter feed. And they have a funny shape to them. I probably noticed their long nose. It's called a rostrum. That rostrum will actually help them detect plankton. Uh, and even their Latin name kind of identifies what they look like. So their Latin name is Polydon spathula. So Polydon means many gills, which is talking about all the gills that they have to breathe, but also these feeding gills. And spathula is a reference to spatula. It's kind of like their nose is sort of shaped like a spatula. Uh, and then their name paddlefish also implies the shape of their nose. They can grow up to about six feet in length. I think the world record for um, this region was 120 pounds. Uh, and you can see this is an older photo of somebody holding a rather large paddlefish. Uh, but they are pretty impressive. And it's interesting to think about them possibly swimming around in the water right now outside of the boat. All right, and I should have warned you I was going to fast forward through a, a couple moments on that video. I'm trying to leave enough time for uh, all the questions and for Captain Ryan's piece, but I think we'll break here. And if there are questions for the environmental science portion of the program, I'm happy to answer those. Um, and all of the things that you saw in the video are things that students can do with us. So me throwing the plankton net in the water, me using the microscope, that's normally what we have all of you do. Um, so when we are able to have field trips again, uh, we hope to have some of you on board so you can help us collect the plankton. But I'll open it up to some questions. Aiden and Simon and Ajna, I'll give you the floor first. Do you have any questions for Miss Susie? Uh, actually, I have one. Um, here in Tennessee, we actually have a couple invasive species. One of them is a kind of mussel. And the other one is Asian carp. Do you know of any invasive species in the, uh, there in Pittsburgh? Yes, we, we also have uh, a freshwater mussel that's invasive, the zebra mussel. It might be the same one that you have. Um, and then there are some concerns too with um, some of the Asian carps and other fish that, that may be in our region. But for sure, we do have the, the zebra mussel uh, we find evidence of them on some of our sampling devices. So um, we have a device that we hang into the water that collects what are known as macroinvertebrates, which are organisms that are large enough to see with your eyes, uh, but they do not have a backbone. So we get a lot of zebra mussels on them. And one of the challenges with zebra mussels is they uh, crowd out and take over um, habitat or um, the ability for our native mussels to grow. They'll literally grow on top of our native mussels. Uh, and they also cause problems for water intake valves. So 
water treatment plants or other industries that have to pull in river water, zebra mussels will get inside the, the piping that they're bringing the river water into and they'll like grow inside the pipe and clog it up. Uh, and they also get on the, the bottoms of boats. So if you're a boater, you have to be very careful if you take your boat from one body of water to another because you can actually move the zebra mussels to a new location. Okay, okay. That's a great Actually, question. I have uh, another quick one. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's another thing in Tennessee we have, but I'm not sure about there in Pittsburgh. Um, we have freshwater jellyfish. They're quite rare. They're about the size of a quarter sometimes, a bit, well, most of the time a bit smaller than that. But um, I've seen, I've only ever seen one and that was in a filled in quarry here. But uh, I was wondering if you had any, anything of the sort. We do, we, and same situation here where it's very rare. I can't say that I have ever collected one, but I am told that they are present in our rivers along with uh, freshwater sponges. Um, and there's a, a local expert at uh, the Carnegie Museums that I, I met with to talk about the sponges. And he said, oftentimes they're mistaken for other things because sponges don't always look like all that of an interesting thing under a microscope. Um, so he does think that there's more that we're seeing. We're just misidentifying them uh, and dismissing it as debris or dirt. But yes, we do have the freshwater jellyfish too. I just haven't been lucky enough to see one, see one myself. What great questions. I didn't yeah. know any of that information. Ajna, Aiden, do you have anything before I ask one question from the Q&A? Okay. Oh, do you have one, Ajna? No. Hi. No, I just wanted to ask if, um, like, what, I guess, like, your favorite educational activity that you ever were able to, like, teach a kid was. Mm. I know that can be really fun sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, in the video, I, I, I showcased our plankton, but my favorite part of our trip is, is the macroinvertebrates. Um, that's what I focused a lot of my time in college on was macroinvertebrates. I was lucky to go to school in the central part of Pennsylvania where there's a lot of great mountain streams and a lot of really cool things to collect. Um, and the whole life cycle of macroinvertebrates is really interesting to me. Uh, but I would say probably one of the things that I like overall about what we teach is we showcase some of the organisms that most people don't ever think about or sometimes ever get a chance to see, uh, especially if it's a microscopic organism or um, even just that, you know, talking about the mayflies that we have in the river. And each year in Pittsburgh, there's a mayfly hatch and a lot of people kind of freak out when the mayflies come out of the water because they see these insects flying around and they don't know what it is. Um, and they are harmless to humans and actually it's a really good sign for river health. So we do sort of like a mini celebration when there's a mayfly hatch because it means the rivers are getting healthier. Um, so I think that's just, you know, fantastic information about our rivers um, and the way our culture's changing in Pittsburgh where we're using our rivers more often. We're using the trails, people are recreating, there's a lot of boaters. So um, just all good things for uh, outdoor recreation. That seems really awesome because I feel like it connects like the science, but also just everyone in the city as well. Mm -hmm. awesome, yeah. All right, uh, just one thing on mayflies. Um, I'm not sure about there, but here they they kind of swarm and they get uh, there. There'll be like maybe 100, 200. So in like one little bush, is it is, is it that bad there? We can have hatches like that. In, in downtown Pittsburgh, there's usually a day or two of swarming, but um, one of the tributaries to the one of the main rivers in Pittsburgh, the Allegheny River, uh, closer to where it starts uh, north of Pittsburgh uh, in Catanning, PA, they really got a ton of mayflies to the point where when they hatch, um, the, the adult mayflies sometimes are all over the main bridge in town and it actually makes it really slippery like an oil slick. And the fire department sometimes has to come out and hose off the bridge. Uh, I've been in Catanning during a hatch where some of the businesses will have a sign on their window that said, don't, don't leave the door open too long because the mayflies will get in. Uh, but again, they're harmless. But it, it, it's just, if you're not into a swarm of insects, it's not your favorite day to be outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, I did a work at the University of Tennessee a while ago. I'm um, doing painting and uh, 
outside the building that, I, that we were working in that during that season, there was always a constant, uh, every time I went there in the morning, the mayflies were always just sitting all around on the ground, like near the entrance. So you couldn't step anywhere without like accidentally getting one on you. And you always yeah. tracked mayflies into the actual university. It was pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is such good questions and comments. So thank you so much. Eduardo has one more before we continue on with the presentation. Eduardo said that we have many mayflies here in Harrisburg um, and wants to know about number one for the mayflies, why does light attract them? If you know that answer. And then he also wants to know um, if, if we can take a ride on the riverboat, where do we go to find out more information on that? Oh, sure. Excuse me? So the, the question about the light, um, I'm honestly not positive other than I can guess that for a portion of the mayfly life cycle, they do live at the bottom of the river. A lot of the ones that are local are burrowing mayflies. So they burrow down to protect themselves from being eaten. But then as they continue through metamorphosis, they shed their exoskeleton and that's when they you know, complete metamorphosis and hatch as an adult. So possibly being able to detect light um, allows them to see their way out of the rivers. Um, so that is one of my guesses, but I honestly don't know for sure. That's a really good question and I'll have to, to research it uh, and find out a little bit more. Uh, but if you do wanna join us on the riverboat, we are doing some select fall tours, but for field trips, and hopefully we can resume that in 2021, uh, you can visit us at www.riversofsteel.com or you can email me at education at riversofsteel.com. Um, both uh, options, I can get you the, the information on our field trips. Excuse me? Yes, Aiden. Um, I, I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, it's about the mayflies. Do they, have, do they have mayflies in Kentucky? I bet they do, yeah. They are um, native to North America. There's actually hundreds of different species of mayflies. Um, so it could be different ones than we have in Pittsburgh. It could be the same ones. I've never had a chance to sample there. And I will say again, you know, a lot of the stuff that we study and freshwater in general, there are people who work on this, but a lot of times they're looking at fish. Um, there's probably not as many people who study the river insects and plankton. In fact, if you try to research some of these things on the internet, there are resources, but there could be more. So I'm hoping future scientists really take a lot, lot of looks at our freshwater ecosystem. Because when you think about the planet, you think about the United States, freshwater yeah. flows into the ocean. So what we're doing here in Pennsylvania can have an impact in, on the ocean. Our rivers make their way all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So it's important for us to keep them clean for the things that live here and because we get our drinking water from the rivers, but we can have an impact on other critters too, things in the ocean. I actually uh, do have an answer to um, uh, Aiden's question on, they are in Kentucky. And I've, I've uh, from the times I've been to places, usually during late summer is when I've found uh, that you see the most of them. And the other time I've been somewhere and they've had almost as many as I've seen in Tennessee was Ohio actually near Lake Erie and Sandusky County. But the worst I've ever seen them was in Wyoming actually. It was in one of the national parks, either Grand Teton or Yellowstone. And it was with my grandparents and we were just driving through and um, we had to turn the windshield wipers on as we were driving through because they kept landing on like all the cars in front of us and behind us too. So it was uh, quite a chaotic situation. All right, well, and I think that probably covers a good bit of our questions and I wanna leave time for, for Captain Ryan's portion uh, because his role on the boat is critical for everything that we do and he has a really cool job. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Captain Ryan, and I'm glad to be with you here today. Um, so I have a little bit more of that video uh, to show you. Um, and uh, it uh, talks a little bit about the lead standards of the boat, uh, what we do. And at the end, if we have time, I have a tour of the engine room that I'd love to give you. Um, so uh, let's see, get that started. About how much time do we have left here? You actually can take more time. Um, 
I'll stop you if it starts going too long, but we for sure need to wrap it up at about five till. All right, I can handle that. And I also wanted to introduce some of our crew today. We also have Captain Evan Clark. So we have two captains on board today. And he's going to talk a little bit about his role here at Rivers of Steel, but also his other job with Allegheny Cleanways. Hi there. I'm a backup captain on uh, Rivers of Steel Explorer. That's been a great job for me. I love being out on the river. I'm out on the river all the time. I live on my houseboat and uh, work on the Explorer, and it's been a great tool for me to learn on. Uh, I've been able to upgrade the tonnage, which means I can now uh, drive bigger boats uh, on Explorer, which has just been huge for me. But also, I uh, take volunteers out on the river and do riverbank cleanup with Allegheny Cleanways. Uh, what we do, uh, we call tireless project, and we take volunteers out on the river and uh, clean trash off the riverbanks. Tires, 55 gallon barrels, pop pans, uh, pop bottles, mostly um, single use plastics is what we see the most of. I just got back from a big cleanup trip where we cleaned uh, uh, riverbanks between Pittsburgh and Monongahela and emptied uh, two large dumpsters worth of trash and a couple hundred tires um, off of our barge on the way. And it's, it was great fun and did a lot of great work. Uh, I've been working with Cleanway since uh, 2006, I believe, now doing these riverbank cleanups, and it's been great to see the riverbanks get cleaner and cleaner over the years as we've removed a lot of the legacy trash. We still see so much single-use plastic come out every year, but a lot of the old stuff is starting to get dealt with, and the riverbanks are getting cleaner and better. And what was your background uh, before coming to Rivers of Steel? I've always been a river rat. Uh, for about 10 years before I moved to Pittsburgh, uh, me and my buddies uh, were building small boats and taking them down most of the big rivers in the country. We went down the Mississippi a couple of times and the Ohio and Tennessee and Tom Bigby and Missouri, uh, a little bit on the Arkansas and some other smaller rivers. And uh, when I settled into Pittsburgh, I found my way to Three Rivers Rowing and did some work for them on the water and then found my way into Tireless Project from there and then found my way onto Rivers of Steel after that. So that's, I'm just so deeply in love with being out on the water. It's uh, really ended up being able to fill my whole life, which is great for me. <laughs> introduce Angela Biederman and she is our chief deckhand on Explorer and Angela if you could tell us a little bit about what you do uh, on Explorer and with River Quest uh, Rivers of Steel and your educational or work background. Sure I'd be happy to. Um, so I started working for Rivers of Steel about two and a half years ago. I started out with part-time uh, just as a deckhand and not the chief deckhand and then it was about a year and three or four months ago that I got hired on full-time. Um, and so what I do in my role um, is that I'm, I'm full-time crew, so I'm available to work on a lot of our trips. Um, I also do maintenance on Explorer, and so um, some examples of things. We do work on the engines, so if we're changing the oil, um, I do work like that. Um, a lot of times we'll go down in these hatches and we'll make sure we're not getting too much water down there. Um, a lot of the uh, inspections and things like that that I do are just, um, you know, making sure the lights are working and the smoke detectors and the other safety equipment that we have. Um, my background is actually in art, and so I have a master's degree in ceramics. Um, and when I moved to Pittsburgh, I was just looking for a little bit of extra work, and that's how I found Business of Steel, and it's been a great organization to work for. Hi, I'm Captain Ryan O'Rourke, and uh, right now you're in the pilot house of the Explorer Riverboat. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what makes this boat special. Now we call this a green boat, um, but what makes it a green boat? 
Well, we have our propulsion system, um, which is a hybrid system. So maybe uh, you're familiar with uh, the Priuses and the car hybrid systems that are both battery and engine powered. Well, Explorer is pretty much the same way. We have our engines and we have batteries, and I'll, I'll show that uh, to you a little bit later. Um, but that keeps our emissions down, it keeps our fuel usage very, uh, very good. And um, that's the primary thing that makes Explorer green. But whenever we were designing this boat, um, we really wanted to make a statement and go as green as possible. Um, so we decided to take some LEED standards um, that they use for certifying buildings as green and apply them to our boat. Uh, some things like uh, our duct socks, um, not, not duck socks, um, but duct socks, um, which are long uh, socks that look like they hang on the, uh, the ceiling and uh, they are our ventilation. So instead of standard ductwork, which is metal, we use these cloth socks, which uh, we can take off the, the ceiling and clean. Um, it also makes, uh, gets the air through the, through the cabin a lot more even than regular venting. Um, so it's actually pretty nice. Uh, we also have a lot of recycled materials on board. The walls are made of like a pressed wheat board, uh, which are compostable at the end of life and uh, are very environmentally friendly to make. The, uh, the carpet that you see is mostly recycled tires. Um, so we use a lot of recycled material in building this boat as much as, as, much as, uh, as possible. I'm going to stop there just for a second um, to see if anyone has any questions so far about uh, working on the rivers or the job um, before we get into the quick engine room tour. We good? Let's keep going. All right. Captain Ryan O'Rourke, and we're in the engine room of the Motor Vessel Explorer. There are many things that make Explorer unique, one of which is its serial diesel-electric hybrid propulsion system, and today I'd like to show that to you. When talking about a serial diesel-electric hybrid system, we're describing a few key features. Propulsion is achieved purely through electric motors. There is no direct connection from the engine to the propeller shaft. This is in comparison to a parallel system, where the engine is directly connected to the propeller shaft. The diesel engine is directly coupled to the generator. Together, this is called a gen set. The engine's sole purpose is to drive the generator and create electricity. And hybrid simply refers to the availability of multiple sources of power. Explorer has two primary gen sets, two battery banks, and an emergency generator, all of which can be used in combination depending on the power needs of the vessel at any given time. Our two primary sources of power are John Deere diesel engines. Because they're part of a gen set, we call them our prime movers, each one rated at 175 kilowatts. Using B5 biodiesel, Explorer could run continuously for 10 days without needing to refuel. The benefit of using engines as prime movers instead of direct propulsion is that we can keep it running at high RPMs where its efficiency is at its peak. At cruising speed, Explorer only uses approximately 7 gallons of fuel per hour. The other half of our gen set is the generator. Connected to the prime mover through a 90 degree gear, the generator has a continuous output of 80 kilowatts at 650 volts. In addition to the generators, we have two battery banks each consisting of 30 8D-sized AGM batteries. They can provide supplementary power when one or both generators can't provide the amount of power being requested by the system. It's also possible to run the vessel entirely on batteries, creating a uniquely quiet cruising experience. If all else fails, we have a standalone fixed-speed 55-kilowatt backup generator. In the event of one or more primary
all the electricity produced by the prime movers, the generators, and the battery banks are routed here to the inverter stack. Consisting of five inverters and two rectifiers, connected by a 650 volt DC link, the system combines and distributes power being requested by the propulsion and hotel loads. On the propulsion side of things, each propeller is powered by two motors. These motors feed a combining gear, transferring power to a single drive shaft. This drive shaft connects to the transmission, and finally, out to the propeller shaft and propeller with a maximum speed of 9 knots. And that's our power generation and propulsion systems for the boat. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Explore, or if you'd like to come take a tour, give us a call at Rivers of Steel. Okay, so there you have it. Um, you got a tour of our uh, engine room. And, uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, so do you have any questions about uh, the engine room or working on the boat? Um, one of my favorite parts uh, of working on Explore is um, just getting kids out on the, uh, on the river and teaching them all about uh, you know, how important it is. Uh, I've always been involved in science ever since I was a little kid. And so uh, being able to get kids out and, and do science stuff, like hands-on science stuff, I just feel is just amazing. This has been such a neat experience. And, you know, we it is sad that students haven't been able to get aboard the Explorer this year just due to everything that's been going on. But just getting that little bit of an experience today was really wonderful and meeting both of you. Rivers of Steel has tons of different tours and initiatives that everyone should check out. Um, the Explorer Riverboat is amazing, but they have tours beyond that as well. Do you two want to say anything else about Rivers of Steel before we turn it over to Audrey to wrap up today? I think I covered my portion, but I wanted to thank our, our student hosts and our, our participants today. Um, thanks for attending our program. Thank you. Yeah, it's been wonderful to be here today. I uh, hope, you, hope everyone learned some stuff about plankton in the boat in the river. We did. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. Audrey, you can wrap up the whole STEM <laughs> Summit. Oh my gosh, my mind is blown. There isn't one aspect of everything that we've seen today that doesn't cut across everything in science, technology, engineering, and math. Everything. And it is just, it's almost like we're wrapping up nine days, but this is the most robust set of opportunities that we have had a chance to really see from, from plant life, biology, to saving, you know, from ecology, from saving our rivers, from, you know, going behind the scenes in terms of how things are, you know, operate in, in with um, Captain Ryan. I mean, there isn't a thing that anyone who is interested in anything and making stuff and building stuff and being a part of the ecosystem that you cannot do. I'm mind blown. I did not think of all these things. And I like to think of myself who has a lot of set of experiences that uh, are pretty robust, but you blew my mind. I thank you, Captain Ryan. Thank you, Susie Bloom. Thank you, Simon, Aiden, Joseph, Ashna. Thank you, Rivers of Steel. We can't do this work without without our sponsors so that we made sure that everything was provided free. So if you didn't have a chance to hear from some of these sponsors, you everything is archived, everything is recorded. Thank you to PCTV, um, Philip Shell Games, Huntington Bank, you know, everyone that has been a part of this STEM work for the last nine days has just been incredible. We look to being on the boat, really people have asked about being on the boat. I wanna be on the boat and uh, I wanna just have conversations, really appreciated understanding the complexity and actually the positive attitude about our rivers. And I think during a time that we're in now with COVID-19, 
We really appreciate the outdoors. We're really, all of us are having new conversations about what it means to be part of the total world. And I think you just all opened up our eyes to this. So I cannot thank everyone enough. Please stay tuned. Join us on pghtech.org. We're always trying to find pathways so that businesses and people who are doing the work like Rivers of Steel are engaged with the minds of tomorrow because they're gonna blow our minds as well. So thank you, Marie Poloni. Thank you everyone at Rivers of Steel. Thank you, PCTV, and stay connected to us at the Tech Council. Have a great, safe weekend. You too. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you for letting me be a co-host.